So we've seen that electroosmotic flow is a key mechanism in capillary electrophoresis. It actually carries with it some very specific benefits that help the separation be, well, awesome, frankly. Um, and so what I want to go over now are just a couple uh, benefits late at night here benefits yeah there we go benefits of electroosmotic flow as a tool in separation science so um, the first benefit is actually going to require us to think about a mechanism we did not talk about when we were talking about pressure driven flow so we're going to learn something new about pressure driven flow here um, by way of contrast with electroosmotic flow uh, and that is that electroosmotic flow doesn't look like pressure driven flow. So what does that mean? Well, we learned that in pressure driven flow, there is uh, essentially, a, there's a shear force that happens at the wall of a drag of a um, friction at the wall that causes this parabolic like flow profile. That is velocities go faster as you get towards the middle and they slow down towards the edge. And so you get this flow profile that looks uh, like a, a parabola, right? So this is with pressure being applied to move that flow. Um, and we get a parabolic flow profile. Uh, with EOF, however, um, flow starts at the wall is a phrase that we say often about this stuff. Um, flow starts by the, the uh, electrophoresis, basically, of the buffer ions in the electric double layer. And so right at the wall, we're, we get pretty much our full velocity. There's the, the small stern layer that doesn't move or barely moves. So low velocity there, but right at the wall, we get our full velocity and that velocity profile is conserved across the entire width of the channel. And so if we drew this velocity profile, it would look something like that. This is often called plug-like flow. Okay, so why is this a benefit? Um, well, it's because there's a mechanism in pressure-driven flow that leads to band broadening that we did not talk about previously. So I'm going to tell you about that mechanism. It's one that I care a lot about. It's, it's intimately related to a lot of work that we do in my lab. Um, and we're going to see basically how that happens here. And then we're going to know by contrast, it does not happen over here. Okay, And that mechanism is called Taylor dispersion. So here's how Taylor dispersion works. Uh, I want you to imagine you have some capillary or some kind of flow channel and you inject into it some narrow band of sample. And we're gonna flow this narrow band of sample down our, our, um, down our channel by pressure driven flow. So we know that the velocity profile it's gonna experience is gonna look something like that right some parabolic flow profile so let's make sure we label this starting point as a narrow band right there okay um and what's going to happen if you take a narrow band like this you subject it to a, a velocity profile like this well it's going to deform it's going to look something like the velocity profile or at least in theory it will um, but in reality this is not exactly what we get. And the reason this is not exactly what we get is because as we learned when we talked about diffusion, uh, we learned that um, diffusion proceeds across concentration gradients. So if this is where all of our sample is, there's a concentration gradient going in that direction, in that direction, another one going in that direction, in that direction. So while we've talked a lot about longitudinal diffusion, that's in this dimension, these concentration gradients lead to what we call radial diffusion in this direction 
here. And so what that actually gives uh, is not this exaggerated band. It just basically by diffusion, this area mixes in, these areas mix in, and you just get a broader, more diluted band. So you get a broad, broadened band. And depending on your velocity conditions, depending on the size of this plug, depending on the diffusion coefficient of the molecules that you're looking at, this can be a pretty dramatic um, effect, right? This, this effect of Taylor dispersion can actually lead to quite a lot of, of band broadening. It's not negligible. So in pressure-driven flow, we get Taylor dispersion analysis. Um, However, so um, yeah, so Taylor dispersion, sorry, not ta Taylor dispersion analysis is a technique that we do in my lab. Taylor dispersion is this phenomenon, and I will just put this down on paper so we're not confused. In pressure driven flow, uh, Taylor dispersion. contributes to our overall um, sigma, basically. It contributes to sigma. It is one mechanism that we have not talked about that contributes to sigma. Um, but in EOF, we have this plug-like flow. Uh, because uh, because flow is driven starting at the wall where the uh, electric double layer exists and therefore no Taylor dispersion. So we've seen faster is better because we avoid um, longitudinal diffusion. Actually, we also avoid this major mechanism of radial diffusion that adds to band broadening. So another way in which EOF is benefiting us in capillary electrophoresis. Um, but there is yet another way in which EOF can be a great tool um, for driving these separations. And that is that uh, EOF Electroosmotic flow can be tuned. What does that mean? It means that we can make some modifications that directly affect the velocity of electroosmotic flow, which, as we'll see um, in just a second, can be really beneficial to designing separation methods. So how can it be tuned? We can tune velocity. So velocity EOF um, can be manipulated. Here's what that looks like. Here's a capillary. And inside this capillary, of course, there's sil these uh, silanols on the wall. They deprotonate above pH uh, 2. And so suppose we have a lot of deprotonated silanols, a lot of charge density here. That's going to give us a high V EOF. So this is with high charge density. at the wall. Um, but suppose instead we have a much lower charge density at the wall. We reduce the total number of silanols that are deprotonated. We will dramatically reduce V EOF. In fact, we can take this to its logical conclusion, which is to say, so let's call this low charge density. The logical conclusion would be to say there's no charge, and in that case, V EOF would be equal to zero. Uh, so this is with no charge. Okay, so a caveat we should point out here is that when V EOF is equal to zero, our apparent velocity is our electrophoretic velocity. Our apparent mobility is our electrophoretic mobility. There is zero velocity contribution from EOF. There's zero mobility contribution from EOF. And that means um, we would only detect uh, cations or anions, but not both. 
We could manipulate that based on which where we apply what voltages, but we could not necessarily see both in under that condition. Um, so sounds like a bad thing. We'll get uh, in just a minute here to why we might want to do any of this. Um, Here's the how though, how would we do this? So we can manipulate this by uh, covalent modification of the surface. Um, this chemistry is the exact chemistry we talked about in bonded phases, because this surface is the exact surface that we use when we have silica particles for bonding a phase two. So we can use some of that um, uh, um, chlorosilane uh, reagents can come in here and essentially click onto these walls and if they if the R groups on those have no charge then we can get very close to a system like this um, we can also modify this with um, by pH okay so here's um, one way that that would look uh, basically at some low pH we'll say below 2 so if this is pH here's our velocity EOF some low pH are we're gonna have very low if if any close to zero velocity EOF as this becomes deprotonated um, it will deprotonate gradually so we'll go through a condition like this where we have moderate EOF until eventually we get to our maximum charge density I actually don't know what kind of pH range we're talking about we're likely talking about in the range of two to you know probably four or thereabouts but you have some range where we're changing the density of um, charge on the wall and that'll change the the velocity EOF and then there are non covalent modifications to the surface that is we can add ion pairing agents to the buffer that's flowing through this thing um, and if we have a high enough concentration of those they'll They'll basically directly interact, although non-covalently, with the surface here, shield some of that charge. We'll see the EOF drop off. This is sometimes called a dynamic capillary coating. OK, so we can do that. Um, we can do another kind of neat thing in a very similar way. So we can. Um, we can reverse, we can take velocity EOF and we can reverse it. How would we do that? Well, here's our standard capillary. It's got negative charge on the wall. We apply a positive voltage over here and a negative voltage over here. And as we've learned it, that makes V EOF go in that direction. Uh, but if we can modify that wall to not carry a negative charge but instead to carry a positive charge so for example we could use a chlorosilane reagent that puts an amine on that wall uh, and now we'd be able to get a cationic wall well in that case with the exact same uh, potential application uh, we would see the EOF go in the opposite direction so that can be done by covalent modification um, it can also be done using uh, alternate capillary materials. They don't have to be silica. Silica has some great properties um, and it is the standard, um, but it doesn't have to be what you use. So that's what we can do to tune EOF and a little bit, sorry, I'm not centered here, a little bit of how we can do it. Um, but it begs the question, why would we do this? Right? Why would we, why would we modify EOF? Uh, because it seems like our discussion has said, hey, the faster the better. Shouldn't we just be going for that condition all the time, right? Highest possible charge density, highest possible EOF, fastest possible separations. Well, it turns out the simple answer is, as usual, not the right answer. That's because if we consider this la um, this B term only phenomenon that we've talked about, um, also referred to by me as the faster you go, the better. That doesn't apply to the whole 
all physics of separation, this is only, um, it only applies to what Van Diemter talks about, which is peak efficiency or band broadening, right? Peak efficiency, number of theoretical plates is not resolution. Number of theoretical plates is not separation. It's just telling us how narrow we can keep our peaks. Really helps us get good resolution, but it's not the whole story, right? Um, it doesn't, for example, we're going to look at one phenomenon that it doesn't consider. It doesn't consider a phenomenon we've talked about previously in the semester, sigma injection, right? We don't start with a truly infinitely narrow uh, injection band. So here's an injection band. There's some sample plug, right? Here's our sample plug, we're going to assume this contains two, two analytes, analyte A and analyte B, right? And it has some finite width. Okay, so whatever that finite width is, if we want to separate analytes A and B, what we're actually trying to get them to do is travel a specific distance, a distance greater than the width of the injection plug, right? So let's call this A. And let's call this B. In order to get two separate bands like this, B has to have traveled a distance greater than, um, so let's call this distance greater than the size of that injected plug, right? And that takes a finite amount of time. Takes a finite amount of time. We can't really just go infinitely fast to get these things to separate from each other. Um, in fact, that finite time this is the last thing we'll say today. That finite time uh, grows, gets larger as um, the electrophoretic velocity of these things gets closer. Right. As they become more and more similar in electrophoretic velocity, it takes longer and longer and longer to be able to get them that distance apart. That's a great argument for um, taking uh, down the velocity of, of electroosmotic flow to lengthen the time of the separation. In fact, what I can tell you is that you can actually get um, electrophoretic velocities in opposition to EOF, and if the electrophoretic velocities are large enough, um, you can send EOF in that direction, but your analytes will slowly migrate in that direction. That technique, so if we were to do, say if we were to counter with a much larger VEP, we'd still detect down here, even though EOF is going that way, and we can get very, very, very close electrophoretic velocities to resolve that way. So this is a technique that's used, um, I'll try and find a paper on this to show you guys next time. This opposition EOF technique um, is used to resolve um, isotopes in CE. So you can take a chloride isotope, um, you know, 35 versus 37. They have slightly, slightly different sizes. They're going to have the same charge, right? But they're going to have very slightly different sizes as they try and move through solution. If you can set up a situation that takes a really long time to make them separate, you can get them to separate. Um, so that's one application of this. Okay, so our two benefits of EOF are um, that it doesn't contribute to Taylor dispersion like we get in pressure driven flow and that we can play these kinds of we can play these kinds of tricks to manipulate EOF velocity or even to manipulate, whoa, flip it again, there we go, even to manipulate EOF direction. That's all we're gonna talk about today, guys. Um, we will get into some deeper detail on electrophoresis as separations, uh, not on Friday, actually, because Friday, I believe, if I have the calendar correct, is our spring recess day, whatever that means. So our next lecture will be coming at you next Monday, and I think, it's just next week. Next week we'll cover um, the rest of electrophoresis. We'll learn a little bit there, and we will start talking about um, some of the some of the papers that you guys have selected um, as your presentations in the week that follows. All right, folks, take care.